in addition to um, registering and being able to watch this online, if you, if even people here, if you register, if you go to academy.mises.org and register for this seminar, How an Economy Grows, then you'll be able to get um, the slides that are, for the, uh, that are being used and recordings of this. <clears throat> so in addition, you'll have a link to this comic. And this is the comic book that we're actually going to use in this presentation. It's called How an Economy Grows and Why It Doesn't. It's by Erwin Schiff, and there's a free PDF online that you'll have access to when you go to the Academy page. Now, it starts off on this island, and there's three people, Abel, Baker, and Charlie, and they all fish. Um, they fish by hand, which as you can imagine is pretty difficult. They don't have any tools to help them in their fishing. Um, so this is a form of production. Now you might think, wait a minute, they're not producing the fish. Fish are already there. Well, you need to produce fish on the plate. Fish in the sea isn't going to do you any good. So what they need to do is produce the product, which is, again, fish on the plate. And the fish on the plate is a consumer's good. So it's something that they're literally consuming or enjoying for its own sake. They're not using the fish to produce anything else. It's a consumer's good. Now, in order to get that consumer's good, they have to use factors of production, resources that they use for that uh, production. And one of the factors that they use is their own bodies, their own hands and eyes to, to go grab the fish. Another factor is the fish that's out there in the sea. Okay? When it's part of nature, economists call that land, even though it's a little weird to call fish land, but there you go. So fishing labor plus fish in the sea equals fish on the plate, which is what they want. That's why they need to engage in production. Now, let's think about their productivity. We see here, but after much trouble, they each manage to catch one fish per day. Now, is that high productivity or low productivity? Very low productivity. And because of that, every day they're able to, Baker and Charlie uh, and Abel, consume the fish each had uh, caught, enabling them to survive to the next day to catch another fish. This is survival, and that's about all. So that means they're in a condition of extreme poverty. They're very poor. They have little time for leisure because they have to spend all day fishing. And they have little time to produce anything else that they might want. There's more to life than just fish. It also means that they're very vulnerable. Okay? They're on the brink of starvation because what if they get sick or what if they break their hand and they have a bad, bad day or even a bad week They'll starve. So Abel one day is sitting, looking at the stars, and he's thinking, you know, there must be more to life than catch, eat, catch, eat, catch, eat. He wants to improve his living standards. He's tired of being poor. And so he thinks of a way to improve his living standards. He, makes, he wants to make a new factor. He wants to make a net. He's hoping that'll improve his living standards. Now, the thing is that he has to gather the net materials. He has to build the net. That takes a whole day. That's a day that he can't be fishing. If he doesn't fish, he doesn't eat for that day. So he has to sacrifice. He has to go hungry. He has to delay consumption. Now, why would he be willing to do that? Why would he be willing to go hungry? What, what, what would make it worth it to make the net? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, to get more food, to be more productive. He wants to raise his productivity above one fish per day's work. So he does. He works, he works, he works. And then finally, at the end of the day, he's created the net. Now, how do we classify the net? The net isn't land because it's not part of nature. There aren't just nets that grow up out of the ground. It's obviously not labor. It's not a consumer's good. He's not using it to, as a back scratcher or something like that. So it's something else. It's called a capital good. Uh, and now, because it's not land, it's not found in nature, he has to produce it himself. Because it's not a consumer's good, it's not something that he wants to use for himself, it's used to produce something else, to produce the fish on the plate. 
So it's a, a capital good is a produced factor of production. Now, he, he's also worried he's got to go hungry, but it might not even work. Now, that's risk, and Peter Klein is going to be talking about risk and uncertainty later. Right now, we're going to kind of ignore that aspect, and we're mostly focusing on time, as you'll see. So he goes out with his new capital good, and he uses it, and he's able to catch two fish in a day. So success. He's had greater productivity. Now, just to make things a little cleaner, we're going to we're going to change the comic. We're going to say that he was able to catch three fish in that day. Okay, so now it's not two, it's three. So let's compare the two production processes because he made a choice. He could either keep fishing with his hands or he could go the net way. Okay, now hand fishing, there's an upside to hand fishing. It's short, it's a short process of production. It, you get results pretty quick. It's just one day, boom, fish. But the downside is that it's not productive. One fish per day, that's not very productive. Then there's building a net and then using the net to fish. The downside of that is that it takes longer at first because you've got to spend a whole day building the net and then you've got to spend a whole day uh, using the net. And so you've got to wait two whole days before you get any results. So it's a longer process of production. But the upside is that it's greater productivity. It's three fish over two days, so that's one and a half fish per day instead of one fish per day. And, af and after that, then, um, then it's two fish per day. So it's much greater productivity, even though at first it takes longer. So basically he's choosing whether to do one fish today, close in time to him, or three fish tomorrow. Now, one versus three, you might think, well, that's a no-brainer. But it's not that simple because of the time element. If it was one fish today versus three fish today, of course, three is better than one. But since it's three fish tomorrow, there is a sacrifice because you have to wait longer. So it's not quite as sweet of a deal. But it's sweet enough for Abel. He's willing to wait for the extra fish, especially because he'll get a net at the end of it. That is actually a kind of an exchange. Now, usually it's weird to call something like that an exchange because he's not making a deal with another person. It's just in his mind. He's making a trade-off in his own mind. He's saying, okay, do I want, if I give up one fish today, then I'll get in return for that three fish tomorrow. So he has to think, is that a good exchange? And for him, it's a good exchange. But it's not good for everybody. As you'll see if you read the comic, later on in the comic, Baker and Charlie, they refuse to do the same thing. They don't want to make a net, even though they see how effective it was for Abel. Because it's not a good enough deal for them. One fish today versus three fish tomorrow, yeah, three is, is, is nice that it's more in quantity, but it's further away in time, and they're just not willing to wait. They want to eat today. Even if it just means one fish today, they want to meet today. That means they have a higher, what's called, time preference than able. Time preference is what Austrian economists refer to as the importance of now, the importance of soon, okay? So for them, sooner is really important to them. So even though one is less than three, it's sooner than three. And so they prefer that over the three. They prefer not to make the net. Maybe the three isn't a sweet enough of a deal. Maybe if the deal was sweetened and, and, it, and the net was more effective and they could get five if they waited, maybe that would sweeten the deal enough that they would be willing to sacrifice and make the net. But three is not enough. They have a lower time, uh, they have a higher time preference than Abel. Abel has a lower time preference, which means he will be willing to save more. So you see, now that he has more fish to consume, and remember we're saying two more fish to consume, because of his low time preference, he has generated savings. Okay? So savings is important because 
it allows him to make even more capital goods. Because the next day, he doesn't have to fish all day. Why doesn't he have to fish all day? Because he's already got fish from the day before. So then he could spend the day doing something else, like creating more capital goods. So for example, maybe he wants to make a rake and use that rake to farm and to grow carrots. So he's used his savings to support capital goods. And the capital goods make him even more productive. The net made him more productive. The rake, the rake gives him more productivity further. So he's got lots of carrots now also. But then it doesn't just stop there because the rake helps the productivity and the productivity helps savings too because now that he has all these carrots and all these fish, he has more stuff to save. So we're not talking about just a line of savings and then capital goods and then productivity. We're talking about a cycle because productivity in turn supports more savings, which supports capital goods, which products productivity. And it goes around and around and around in what we might call a cycle of growth. This is a virtuous cycle of growth. And with every lap around that cycle, he's getting richer and richer. He, you, can, you can imagine every time he goes around that cycle, just more tools are piling up that he can use. And his living standard improves with every lap around the cycle too. Because now the more he has, the less vulnerable he is. Now he's really far away from starvation. He's far away from the brink, the edge of starvation. Because now even if he has a bad day or a bad week, he, he ain't starving, he's fine, okay? And because he is so product, he's so productive and he has so much stuff, he can actually consume more than he used to at the same time as he saves more than he used to. Saving doesn't have to necessarily mean going hungry all the time. If you're more productive, it just means saving some of the stuff that you could consume. Now, this is how living standards rise in a market economy as well, in a very complex market economy like the one we live in. But we'll learn more about that from Mark later. Right now, we're going to stick to the island. Now, people in the community, they uh, start having his own, their own ideas about what he should do with his savings. So one guy says, how about charity? Divvy up, man. And let's think about that phrase, divvy up. Okay. That actually represents something that's kind of a big word. It's called egalitarianism. Now, egalitarianism basically means equalizing things. Okay. So what he's saying is that, um, that Abel now is wealthier and the guy is less wealthy, so he wants Abel to give him some of the wealth that makes Abel poorer and that makes him richer, so they get closer to being equal, right? Now, a lot, a lot of times that's stimulated by envy. If you just see someone who has more than you, um, you want their stuff. But it often results in something called primitivism. So some tribes stay really poor because of egalitarianism. In some tribes th um, throughout history, what will happen is that if any member of the tribe starts to save more than usual, then other members of the tribe, they start applying social pressure. They start saying, hey man, divvy it up. Divvy it up. Or like Obama says, spread the wealth, right? And now let's think about what kind of an effect that has on the cycle of growth. If every time you save more, you have to give up that savings to spread the wealth, is that going to encourage you to save more or discourage you to save? Discourage you, exactly. It's going to discourage saving. And remember that this whole cycle of growth depends on saving. So if you, take, if you knock out saving, then you knock out the whole thing, you break the cycle of growth. In fact, not only that, 
it becomes a cycle not of growth but of shrinking. It, it actually leads to becoming poor. Because what happens is that decreasing savings can lead to capital consumption. Consuming capital. What does it mean? We said that the net was capital. So does consuming capital mean he starts eating the net? No. What it means is that the net eventually wears out. It needs to be repaired. Repairing capital goods requires resources. If you don't save enough, you can't support repairing the capital goods. They start breaking down. The net eventually just tears and fish just start swimming through it. And then it's not even a capital good anymore. It's useless. And then you're back to the productivity that you started with. And so you end up, you're, you're back to where you started. You're poor again. Okay. So that limits productivity. Now there's another character here. There's a guy with a club who's waving it at Abel. And he says, well, how about this? And basically he wants to steal Abel's savings from him. Now, that also happens a lot in history. For example, there are these, uh, this type of people called brigands, and it's just like a band of ruffians that goes around and looks for rich communities, wealthy communities, and they just come in and invade, and they, they take all their stuff. Now, if that happens all the time, if every time you save up and you become a rich community, and, uh, and then you get raided by barbarians each time, is that going to encourage savings or discourage savings? Again, it's going to discourage savings. It's going to have the same effect. It's going to turn the cycle of growth into a cycle of poverty. Sometimes the brigands, they don't just come in and then leave. They come in and then they settle down. And they, they call themselves the nobility. And the top brigand calls himself the king. And they still plunder, but they... They just call the plunder taxation. Um, they call it by another name, even though it's the same thing. They also do something called proscription. So what can happen is that if any individual in the community starts to get really wealthy, starts to accumulate a lot of wealth, then the king will find some excuse to throw him in prison or, or kill him and take his wealth. Um, and so that's why in history, there are a lot of stories of buried treasure, like in the um, Arabian Thousand and One Nights. And basically what they're doing is basically trying to hide the treasure from the king so that you don't get proscribed. Now, buried treasure is not invested treasure. If you bury your treasure, it's not going towards the production of capital goods. So again, that creates poverty. But it's not just kings who plunder Democracies plunder too. Democracies, sometimes their favorite kind of plunder is called progressive taxation. Um, it, now with progressive taxation, if you save a lot and become more productive, then you get taxed even more than everybody else. So that is another form of egalitarianism, actually, because basically they're trying to tax the rich to bring them closer to the poor, to make them more equal, but it's also plunder because it's taking it by force. Now, what about greed? This little bird who apparently comes into the story, I don't know why, uh, he says, won't it be uh, bad if Abel turns into uh, be a greedy guy wanting more and more wealth? And the owl says, bad for who? The only way Abel's wealth can increase is if he makes his wealth available to other members of the community. And when you think about it, that makes sense because there are only so many fish that Abel can eat. There are only so many uses he has for his own nets. Similarly, think about modern times, Steve Jobs and iPhones. There's Steve Jobs, when he was alive, he had a lot of iPhones. But there's only so many iPhones that he himself can, can really benefit from using them himself. He doesn't love Angry Birds that much. And it's not like he like bathes in iPhones or something like that. So the only way that he can benefit from them 
is by exchanging them with other people. Sort of like here in the comic, how Abel is renting his nets, his extra nets, and he's loaning out fish. And both of those practices are exchanges. Big savers can only benefit from their savings if they use them for exchanges with other people. And the thing about exchanges is that they're win-win. Some people like to think of them as win-lose, like there's only one winner in an exchange and then there's one loser. But by definition, they're win-win, both win. Because if you give up something in order to get something, by definition, you value the thing that you get more than the thing that you give up. And that's true for the other party too. So all exchanges are win-win. So the more exchanges that Abel's savings enable him to do, the more people he benefits. Think about Steve Jobs. He and Apple saved a lot of money. They created a lot of iPhones and made millions of exchanges, win-win exchanges. He benefited millions of people throughout the world. So there, but that's one kind of exchange that can be, happen because of savings, is production and sale. But also lending at interest is another kind of exchange. Or you could use your savings to pay wages. That's another kind of an exchange. And through all these exchanges, what happens is that non-savers, they get access to capital goods that would have been completely out of reach if it hadn't been for the saver. So his savings benefits everyone. His capital benefits the whole community, not just himself. That cycle of growth that we saw, that lifts everybody up. Capital lifts the whole community up. So if Abel's able to get rich by making many exchanges, he's, made, he's benefited many people. But then again, when egalitarianism, spreading the wealth around, and plunder, break that cycle of growth, so now it's not just hurting Abel, it's not just hurting the saver, it hurts everyone. Everyone that might have made an exchange with him if he had been allowed to save. So there's nothing fishy about growth. There's nothing fishy about savings, nothing fishy about accumulating capital. There's nothing fishy about being productive. There is something very fishy about egalitarianism and plunder. Thank you.